Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the third turn of the Shadow Tech Goddess, Stenabel. When last we visited this crazy, crazy little world, Stenabel was doing bad things on Hoffman Plate, Planetfall. She was kidnapping people, robbing people, abducting people, whoring people, and loving every second of it. Under the influence of the potent bolabongs provided her by her benefactor, Hannah Ben Sherlamp EV. Oh, our Stenabel was not doing very ladylike things. She was walking up to people in a winsome fashion, an angel smile upon the face, asking questions to those newly arrived and feeling the sickening tug of Planet Falls gravity, and then giving them a little crack on the head, a little kiss with her brown holy stones sending them back to the little dungeon she had created where she may then pick their bones at her leisure and then put them out in the trash. Cinnabel then came across her old adversary, Lieutenant Gwendolyn of Prentice, the lady who was responsible, at least in her mind, for losing her, her chair, throwing her on the bag, and costing her her freedom. Cinnabel challenged the very large Lieutenant Gwendolyn to a fight, and Stenabel beat the shit out of her. All bunged up, having no inhibitions, having full access to her to her abilities. She doesn't have any additional, and it's not like steroids, or she doesn't have superpowers, but she's given full lease and confidence to use what she's got. Lieutenant Gwendolyn didn't really think much of her, and paid the price getting her ass kicked, but then Stenabel took her precious watch, the one thing that this Lieutenant Gwendolyn seems to care about, and broke it underfoot, and then took it with her as a war trophy, and then cracking the unconscious Lieutenant Gwendolyn on her noggin with her bowie stone, thereby imprisoning her in her dungeon. So this week, we move on to chapter five, Aram and Alesta return. So obviously, Stenabel needs help. Sometimes those who are most desperately in need of help are the least apt to acknowledge it. And we'll see how the humble Aram and Alesta are able to deal with Stenabel. Stenabel, in her current state, wouldn't hesitate to put grievous harm on the both of them. She's a very dangerous person at the moment. So we'll see what happens. Enough of me chattering about. Let's get to this. Chapter 5. Aram and Alesta return. When Stenabel returned to her room, she was somewhat surprised to discover her room was not empty. Sitting inside were Lord Aram and Lady Alesta. Alesta did not look happy. She sat forward in her chair, shoeless, her traveling boots removed and placed neatly in a corner. Well, hello, Stenabel said, removing her HRN. I figured I'd be seeing the pair of you again, just not this soon. Alesta didn't mince words. Just what are you playing at? She said in a strained voice. Stenabel sat down and poured herself a drink. Sorry. Not certain I know what you're talking about. Gwendolyn! You could have killed her today! Oh that! I was simply exercising my right to a little revenge. Stenabel savored the memory of Gwendolyn face down in the alley, her watch cracking underfoot. She savored the memory of kissing her bloody mouth. How is it that you saw that? We were alone in the alley. We see everything, Belle. We watched you attack Gwendolyn in the alley. And we've seen everything else as well. Kidnapping? Robbery? Random thuggery? How could you? Stenabel curled her lip. And what of it? Aram spoke up. Belle, we think you've become addicted to those bolabungs you're wearing. We headed back here as quickly as we could to help you out. I see. And where were you? Oh, let me guess. Out gallivanting across the universes, assisting other uh, male versions of me. Is that right? That's right. 
Did you two put that quaint picture in my coat? We did, Aram said. It was my idea. We thought it might help jog your memory or something. Stenabel pulled Gwendolyn's watch out of her pockets. That picture is meaningless. Probably a fake. It is not, and you know it, Aram said. Listen, this will come as a surprise to you, but where we come from, you and Gwendolyn are very close. You love her, in fact. She is to be your countess, Stenabel scoffed. I cannot say much for my taste in women, then, can I? Your connection with Gwen spans the universes. Your souls are connected. I'd hope that picture might stir those feelings within you. Oh, it stirred something, all right. Gwendolyn Apprentice is a shock tight bitch, and I am going to enjoy making her suffer. She took everything from me. She was doing her job, Alesta said. Perhaps she should get a different job. I bloodied her face today and broke her watch and enjoyed everything. Every moment of it. I don't believe I'm done with her just yet. Stenabel gazed at the watch with cruel delight. That watch was a precious gift to Gwen. You gave it to her. Alesta was shouting. Did I? Well, perhaps she can have it melted down for a paperweight. Bell! Alesta yelled, standing up. Listen to yourself. That is not you talking. It's those damn bolabungs you're wearing. They are getting into your mind, making you into something that you're not. We have freed Gwendolyn from your little prison, by the by. Yes, we know all about your purple holy stone knockout gas and took precautions. She is safe and sound aboard her ship and has no idea what you are planning on doing. Now... As a friend, because you are a person Rami and I both cherish, I am going to kindly ask you to remove those bolabungs and give them to me. Give them to me now. And the watch as well. Alesta held out her hand. Stenabel scoffed. You two are strangers to me. You say you know me. Well, I do not know you. And for that matter, I don't know if I even like you or not. Those bullabungs are a revelation, and this watch is a trophy dedicated to the new me. With these, there is nothing I can't do. Nothing I can't accomplish. These bullabungs are going to build me a fortune. Why in the name of creation would I want to be rid of them? Because they are turning you bad, Belle, Alesta said. We know you have cause to be angry with Gwen. We know she was rather hateful to you. However, that does not give you the right to enslave her, to hold her in chain and torture her, to break the things that are dear to her. The bullabungs are stripping you of your reason and your humanity. They are turning you into a thief and a selfish, hateful woman. Now, give them to me before it's too late. I'll not ask again. Denabel stood up and walked a few paces towards Alesta. She pushed her bosom out, proudly displaying the five colorful bullabungs hanging at her throat. Then why don't you come and get them? If you can. Apparently you saw what I did to that fool Gwendolyn. So what could you possibly... Before Stenabel knew what was happening, Alesta sprang with surprising speed, grabbed her by the arm, threw her through the air, and had her down on the floor, her soft but Undeniably firm foot squarely planted on Stenabel's throat. The watch flew from her hand and landed on the carpeting. And then the bullabungs came away, and her world faded into a prismatic spray. Stenabel awoke, as if from a fevered dream. She appeared to be in bed, floating atop the stormy seas of sanity, boiling with disconnected memories and drifting voices. She heard talking, wrapped in vivid color. I didn't know you could fight like that, Bear Bear. I'm a dare, Rami. We all get taught to fight. It's not a skill I hope to make use of often. Well, actually, I found it rather stimulating. Really? 
Stenabel tried to say a few words, and something leaned over her in the color dark. You're having a fever, Bell. Your mind became accustomed to the Bullabungs, and it's reacting to their loss. I'm sorry I had to do that to you. We're both here with you, and we're not going anywhere. I'm... I'm frightened, Stenabel's voice said, shaking. It's all right to be afraid, Belle. The two figures got next to her in bed and held on to her trembling body. Like a buoy in a turbid sea, she clung to them and rode out the storm. She felt a soft kiss on her cheek. She reacted and licked her lips. Stenabel replayed the scene in the alley in her mind, standing over Lieutenant Gwendolyn, her mouth bloody, savagely kissing her in the mouth in anger, the power she felt. But the anger was gone. A moist pair of lips met hers and then fell away. She opened her eyes. Ruddy morning light filtered in through the windows. Stenabel was in bed, surrounded by damp towels and rubber bottles filled with cool water. Her body ached all over. A thin woman with shoulder-length braided hair stood leaning over her, holding a scanner. Alesta! Aram! She's awake! The woman said, calling over her shoulder. Stenabel focused on the woman. She was swarthy and rather thin, wearing a tight hospitaller uniform. Her face was made up and she had green eyes. She was holding a small scanner, pointing it at her head. A flickering light came out of the back end of the scanner, bathing her in a reddish haze. Aram and Alesta came in. Alesta carried a small coffee service. Morning, Belle, she said in a cheery manner. It's wonderful to see you up. How are you feeling? Stenabel's head was a wrung out, sweaty mess. My head hurts. I feel sick. That's normal, the hospitaller said. Bolabungs, especially the more complicated ones, have a persistent tendency to leach neurotransmitters from your brain. You're lucky. Your friends here went a long way in saving your life. You were quickly growing a terminal dependency. Who are you? She asked. The hospitaller put her scanner away. Morgan Jetterix, Lady of Thompson. D d do I know you? She gave a short laugh. I just kissed you on the lips. What do you think? Stenabel didn't know what to make of that. Alesta put the service down and poured a cup. We went and got Morgan Bell. We wanted to make sure you're okay. Got her? Yes. Morgan's dead in this reality. Morgan winced a little. Yep. There's only one of me, and here I am. The fire got me. Morgan's eyes seemed to dance with greenish light. Want to see me do a trick? She asked. You like being scared? But I can scare the daylights out of you. I have no doubt, Stenabil said. Morgan, you promise to behave, Aram said. Oh, but just look at her. She's so cute. I could just suck her dry right now. Morgan Jetterix carried an intensity about her that unsettled Stenabel. Unlike the bloody kiss from Gwendolyn that made her feel powerful, her lips where Morgan had kissed her felt cold and lifeless. We needed a hospitaller immediately, Belle. You were very far off the grip, so we went and got Morgan. What? I was what? She asked. Sorry, it's a dare term. We thought we were losing you. We needed Morgan's expertise to assist in your care. It's rather funny seeing you like this, Belle, Morgan said. But it is you. Genetically, you're the same, except for the saturation of female hormones in your tissues, your breasts, your childbearing pelvis, your vagina and other associated female plumbing, and you're over a foot shorter. Stenabel pushed the covers back and sat up, holding her head. She was wearing a sweaty nightgown. Morgan gave her the once-over. And will you look at those cute little feet? My creation. Stenabel felt bashful. What? My feet? Morgan reached out to grab her foot and Stenabel quickly moved them both away. Ha! <laughs> Looks like some things never change, no matter what realm of reality one finds oneself in. You're just as square here as a woman as you are back there as a man. Belle, don't mind Morgan. She has a novel sense of humor, and she promised to behave. Haven't you, Morgan? Aram said. Yeah, yeah, you have all the things I gave to you, yes. 
That's important because you never know when I might go pop. Right here, Aram said, patting his coat. Alesta offered Stenabel a cup of coffee, which she accepted. So, I have a question. The three of you are from another universe or plane of reality or, or whatever. Is that right? That's right, Bell. Aram said. Think of it like this. There are an infinite number of universes, but we are only concerned with eight of them. There's an arcane device called the anatometer out there that has pulled these eight universes together and tangled them up. Our mission is to assist you in untangling it. So there are eight universes caught up in this mess, each a little different from the next, with universes one and eight being quite a bit different from each other. Me, Alesta, and Morgan here come from Universe 1, okay? That's our home. That's where we belong. You come from Universe 3. So right now, there are two of me in this universe. There's the Aram who supposed to be here in Universe 3, the guy who flew with you on the Seeker, and then there's me. I'm a Volgrim, a visitor. I don't belong here. I belong in Universe 1, so does Alesta. I'm here via arcane methods and won't be staying long. The other Aram is probably on Kana right now, back at the fleet. It's the same with Alesta. She's out there somewhere, too. There's only one Morgan, so she's the only one of herself. But how? How does that work? I don't know. There's a lot of technology involved. It's all pretty complicated, and we really don't understand how it works. We just go where we're told. We go here, we go there, we go where you need us. We also can't stay here forever, but in the short term, no damage is done. We're here to guide you, and the other versions of yourself. Once everything's fixed, we go back to where we belong, and that's that. She took a few sips of her coffee. You seem to have great knowledge and understanding of this situation. Is it too much to hope that you know the information I seek for the professor? Do you know the positioning of Camera? She was hopeful as she awaited the answer. Aram frowned and shook his head. No, Bell, we don't. Then I need to I need to resume my activities with the George Parr as soon as possible. I have information to collect for the professor. Hannah Ben Sherlamp, yes. I hate to tell you, Bell, but the George Parr is gone, Alesta said. Gone? You've been flat on your back for better part of a week. Morgan said. She was alarmed. She wobbled out of bed and went to the terrace. Sure enough, the ship was gone, replaced at the dock by a seedy-looking merchantman and a flock of dark planetfall birds. She whirled around in frustration. Well, now what am I going to do? The professor promised she would provide me with information that could help preserve my house should I get her what she wanted. I... Thank you for your concern regarding my health. However, I wish you would have allowed me to proceed unassisted. I have my house to think of. Should its preservation have cost me my sanity and my life? Then so be it. I would have given them. Morgan reached out and pinched her on the cheek. Listen to her. Oh, you're just as dramatic over here as you are there, too. Alesta put her cup and sat down on the bed. I know you're disappointed, but we have an alternative plan. You're not alone. We're going to help you. Stenabel stood there. Her head ached. She couldn't think. Couldn't make her mind work. How? How are you going to help me? Well, for one, the professor cut you off the moment the George part blasted off and you weren't on it, Aram said. My room? Stenabel asked, somewhat alarmed. I, I don't know if I have the money to pay the innkeeper at this time. You don't, Belle. We paid the innkeeper. Stenabel blushed, unused to being a pauper. Then I owe you money. You don't owe us anything. I pay my debts, especially to my friends. Alesta smiled. She beamed. Belle, you, you consider us your friends? Of course. Aram joined in. No worries, Belle. Our contact has given us quite a bit of information. Therefore, once you're ready, we can proceed. Alesta rubbed her head. She felt slow-witted and dull. A contact? What contact? Morgan gave a sly smile. Go ahead, Aram, tell him. I mean her. Tell her. Stenabel awaited their answer as she tried to clear her head. Aram spoke. Your wife, Bell, from another reality. She set us to this task. We couldn't refuse her. M my wife? A very kind, very enchanting woman. It is from her we get our information and our ability to cross the realms. 
She has vast technology at her disposal. Lieutenant Gwendolyn? No. No, Morgan said, jumping in. She seemed to flush with jealousy. Not the Murthig. Aram continued. It's not Gwendolyn Bell. She is a tall, blonde-headed lady, very stately, yet somewhat sad and full of care. She wears a flight suit like a marine pilot and carries a gun. That's what I remember most about her, the gun in its holster. Stenabel held her aching head. All of this was too much for her. She lay back on the bed and closed her eyes. What's her name? Aram and Alesta exchanged glances. You know, she's never told us, and when in her presence, it doesn't seem necessary to ask. She has a very mystical presence, and she's an amazing woman. That is all we need to know. Alesta spoke in her soothing voice, slowly giving Stenabel time to process. There's more going on here than you could possibly know, Belle. It all has to do with the device that was stolen from you known as the Anatameter. You lost it, not here, but in Universe 1 where we come from. It wasn't your fault, but it's imperative that we reclaim it before the Nilus of Punt do. That is our overall task, and it will take us across universes 1 to 8. As such, you and seven other aspects of yourself are caught up in it as well, and all eight of you have your specific roles to play in recovering it. That is a task we have been given to guide you and the others as best we can. And my wife with a gun and... No name asked you to do all this for me? She asked. She did. Then you are indeed true friends, and I'm sorry I didn't see it from the outset. So tell me, wh what must I do? Alesta answered. Yours is an important early step in our quest. In this reality, Universe 3, your goal is to discover Camera. Once it is known, then the others may continue. So the woman with the gun has told us. Well, then I failed. The information for discovering Camera is on the George Parr. We shall take you there. We shall walk the Star's Road, Bell. We have permission, Alesta said. The Marion's Road? It, it doesn't exist. Yes, it does. And with it, we can go anywhere we have laid eyes upon at a moment's notice. We can't do it from here, though. There's too much power. We need a place where there are no power fields to disrupt it. Some place quiet and rural, far removed from the bustle of the city. We shall have to set out for Cana. Once there, we may walk our road, and we will send you to the George Parr. So then my task is the same for you as it is for Professor Sherlamp, to get the stellar positioning of Camera. That's right. Once we know where Camera is, we can look at it through a telescope, and then travel there on the Marion's Road. I have uh, been told the Zaffin Rodrigo of Bergen has the information. Morgan spoke up. Your professor has it wrong. She thinks Rodrigo of Bergen has the data, and stealing it will be as easy as downloading it from him. That's not the case at all, is it, Alesta? Alesta shook her head. No, Rodrigo of Bergen doesn't know where Camera is either. But he's seeking it for the same reasons we are. To get to the anatometer. And do what with it? Put an end to the universe. A great bomb went off in Stenabel's gut. What? Is that possible? It is. They've done it elsewhere, and it's not a pretty sight. Professor Sherlamp didn't think they could actually do such things. They can. And if they get to camera, they might just do it here as well. We have to get there first. None of that made any sense to Stenabel. She tried to stick to the concrete and easily understandable. Then where is the information? The Merton has it, Morgan answered. Alesta jumped back in. Before you ask, Bell, there's one thing you need to understand. This quest spans the reality, spans the planes. It is an extra planar quest, and as such, it involves extra planar entities. The Merton that Morgan refers to is an extra planar entity. Morgan stood and paced back and forth, full of nervous energy. The Merton is my favorite. She said in an odd voice, The Merton is a messenger of sorts, carrying the universe's mail. That's where the location of camera is kept, in the Merton's little head. Thing is, you usually have to kill the Merton to get it out. The information is not written down on a piece of paper. 
were scanned to a file. It's inside the Merton. Burn the Merton. Bleed her. Listen to her dying breath. That's where you'll hear it. Uh, who is this Merton? Melazar of Caroline, Aram answered. Images flashed through her head. Professor Sherlamp's serral cone information bubbled up. Melazar of Caroline is a known associate of Rodrigo of Bergen. She is his tropist. She gives him pleasure. She is... She does, and she's never far from his side. And you're saying I have to kill this person? Morgan laughed. She seemed ferocious, intense, on the edge of delirium. Well, who said that, Bell? Rodrigo of Bergen would have to kill her to get the information. I don't think he's aware of her status. He thinks the information's gonna come from the silly statue he lugs around. That he f he feeds it enough shadow tech... It'll start talking and tell him what he needs to know. But he's wrong. He's all wrong. It's his little tropis giving him orgasms all day long that has it. When you show up, she'll give it to you. Why me? Morgan coiled up in sudden ferocity and opened and closed her fists. Though it may have been a trick of the light, her beautiful face became cracked and ugly. Aram reached into his coat and pulled out a small vial. He opened it and let Morgan take several whiffs. She seemed to calm a bit and lost her ferocity. Her face returned back to normal, if it had ever changed at all. Aram spoke. Because you are also an extraplanar entity, Bell. Me? You are a Kadar Gamain. It's an old Cimmerian term that means the one who is everywhere. You exist in every plane of reality, mostly as a man, but here as a woman, and in others as alien creatures. That is very rare. Most people do not exist in every plane. Myself and Alesta certainly don't. Your status gives you a great deal of power, and Melazar of Caroline will react to your presence and give you the information we need. Careful, though, Morgan said. Mertens die a lot. It's hard to keep a Merton alive. Cenabelle sat up and tried to tame her wild black hair. Well then, I'll do my best. Let's begin. Uh, where are my clothes? Please. Belle, you need to rest another day or two, Alesta said. No, no, I'm, I'm ready to begin now. I have my house to think of. Morgan walked away. I'll get your clothes. You just sit there and relax, right, cutie pie? Stenabelle was shocked as Morgan walked away. I don't think I like that person, she said to Alesta. Bell, Morgan is a free spirit and a tragic one too. She is also an extraplanar creature. She is a, a victim of circumstance and, Alesta struggled for words, without proper chaperoning, she can be somewhat dangerous. D -d dangerous? Rami and I are here, and we will make certain she doesn't get out of control. You might as well know that where we come from, she loves you very much, and that love carries with it a bit of danger. She was very angry you selected Gwen over her. But never fear, we are here to monitor the situation. When I... what? Th this is so confusing, hearing about things I've done, but that I haven't done. And if I'm being frank, if I were a man, I could not see myself picking either of them. Lieutenant Gwendolyn is a brooding giant of a woman, and this one is, well, I'm not certain what she is. Morgan reappeared, holding Stenabel's clothes. I heard every word you said, and I'll tell you what I am, Belle. I, unlike you, am someone who's not afraid to follow her heart, no matter what cowardly bore or dreadful oaf it leads me to. She took Stenabel's pants and tossed them at her, forcing her to catch them. I offered you something I'd not offered any before, not in centuries. Centuries? Stenabel asked. She's ex exaggerating, Alesta said. She threw her shirt and her socks at her. I am not. I was ready to commit myself to you alone. And look what I got for my devotion. Ignored. Cast aside. Humiliated. Yes, I think I know what that feels like quite well. Thank you, Stenabel said, picking her clothes up. Morgan held on to her coat. Oh, and look, look at this. You have a teeny tiny HRN coat too. How dare Darling, Morgan's complexion seemed to take on a ghastly hue for a moment. 
Oh, darling, she said again in a slightly different voice. Where we come from, the sisters did something to your HRN. It never shows any damage. It never even gets dirty. Is that the same here? Aram asked. Stenabel put her hand out. I have no idea. May I have my coat, please? Morgan held it up in the air out of her reach. You didn't say the magic word, Belle. I already said, please. That's not it, Morgan said. Then you have me. What is it? Morgan narrowed her eyes. It's Tempest Spindal. They checked out of the inn, Aram paying the bill, and made their way to the noisy docks. Several burst down, a white ship awaited them. As they got closer, Stenabel saw the name of the ship and stopped dead in her tracks. The Demophilon John? This is our ship? It is, Belle, Alesta said. Rami spoke to Lieutenant Gwendolyn, and as they are heading to Cana anyway, she agreed to allow us passage. How are we paying for this passage? Never mind. It's paid. Stenabel recalled Gwendolyn face down in the alley, the bloody kiss, and she'll allow me to set foot aboard her ship? It's already taken care of. They went up the gangplank and checked in with the marine guarding the entrance. He escorted them into the interior of the ship, where three small rooms awaited them. Stenabel didn't see Lieutenant Gwendolyn along the way and was rather glad for it. She dreaded seeing her. She had no idea what she would say. Soon, the ship blasted away from Hoffman Plate. And with that, we conclude Chapter 5, Aram and Alesta Return. So, Aram and Alesta, seeing the doings of Stenabel as she robbed the, whore, the dock folk and did other things that were quite nasty, they, they can see, they have a fountain in the city of Mons Eagle where they can look in on the doings of all of this. And they see... Stenabel screwing up on Hop and Plate, and then they go to save her from these from these bolabungs she's wearing. So Stenabel's task is an early important first step. But they can see what she's doing, see her screwing up, and head over to help her out. And Stenabel had no intention of taking those bolabungs off. Lady Alesta, being a dare from the House of Dare, they all get trained in martial arts to some extent. And so Stenabel basically judo flipped her to the ground before she knew what was happening. And they got those bullabungs off her neck. And then for about a week, she was flat on her back suffering from withdrawals from these bullabungs. And it's a good thing that they removed them because she was close to being terminal with with these bullabungs on she wakes up her head hurts she's confused the george parr is gone it moved on days ago and hannah ben Sherlamp cut her off immediately instead of having no money aram and alesta had to pay her tab and then they went and get morgan jetterix who's a hospitaller to look her over and assist in her recovery and morgan if you remember from the shadow tech goddess books is a creature known as the tempest Vindal, the one and only quite the opposite from the kadar gamain kind of like a a vampire sort of she seeks the energy of the kadar gamain and wishes to feed upon it and she in a more calm state created salves and tonics and potions to help calm her down in these periods when she begins to act up and lose control of herself and that's what aram had in his coat was a potion that she herself had created and you know he lets her sniff it and it brings her back down to the ground a little bit for a short while kind of a a wild card morgan is because being a tempest vandal she's going to give in to her urges at some point you just don't quite know when and she talked about you know hey Let's see, I bet you I can scare you. And she sure can, because that's one of the Tempest Vandal's abilities, is to create a wave of fear. Fear like you've never known. So Stenabel is freed from the Bullabungs, and now her quest is to get aboard the George Parr. 
And they tell her that it's not Captain Duval that has the info, and it's not Rodrigo Bergen. It's his tropist, Melazar of Caroline. And so that is her quarry, her target. That's who's got the information. And being a Kadar Gamain, the one who is everywhere, when she encounters Melazar, Melazar should just give her the information in one shape or another. First, she's got to get on the ship, and in order to walk the Marion's Road, as long as Lady Alesta has seen a place with her own eyes, whether it be it a, a ship or a city or a planet, she can utilize the Marion's Road and basically teleport there instantly. So she's been inside the George Parr taking a, a, a civilian's tour so she she can teleport there without too much trouble. They just need to get to an area where there's no power, like out in the country. And that's where they're planning on going is to the country side of Cana. And that there she can walk the road and send Stenabel onto the George Parr. But unfortunately, they have to book passage aboard the, the Mofalon John. Again, that horrible scouting ship that Stenabel knows all too well and that is captained by Lieutenant Gwendolyn, the lady she just got done kicking ass with. So she's feeling pretty rotten about that. Next chapter, chapter six, the Demophilon John of all things. And we'll see how the story continue so she's free of the bowl of bungs but she's kind of right back where she was again very unsure of herself very tentative and she's going to need a lot of help going forward and aram and alesta who care about her very much are willing to offer that help so until next week this is ren presents i am your host ren peace out (laughs) 